Hello! Today we are going to talk about charged coupled devices. These are devices that made digital photography as we know it possible because although devices could have been made to make digital cameras, they would have been much more complicated and expensive. And so the charged coupled device made it affordable so that we could have digital photography as we know it. The immediate predecessor to the charged coupled device was a device called a bucket brigade, which was a digitally controlled analog shift register. And the basic idea was we had a number of capacitors. So I'll just draw a few of them. There's one, here's another, another. I'll just draw five of them. This is just an idea. It's not really a schematic of how it works, but this is the idea of how it worked. And between each of these, we would have a switch. So here's some switches and an output switch also. So we connect those together. Oops, we need another. There we go. Connect that, connect that. And let's open these switches. So the idea was that we would have an input over here. And let's just assume these are all grounded. So I'll just connect those all together, grounded. So the idea was that we would have an input over here that would charge this capacitor to whatever voltage was being sampled at the moment. This, of course, would be done at very high speed to sample sound. So they would ideally do that at 144 kilohertz, but maybe lower in the days that these first came about. So we charge this capacitor up. And now what we want to do is transfer the charge down here and just make an audio delay. So we're going to close this switch that's going to transfer the charge from that capacitor to that capacitor. Then we open the switch again. And now we're ready to recharge this capacitor with a new voltage. But in the meantime, we're going to close this switch and transfer the charge over there. And then we will open that switch, close this switch, and now transfer the charge over here. Open that switch. Now, as you can see, the charge is getting transferred from one capacitor to the other. And of course, we can have another charge right behind it because once again, we charge that capacitor. And as we move the charge along the analog shift register, if you will, we can reload it and keep new charge coming in. So we transfer that charge over. Finally, we close this switch, transfer the charge to the output capacitor, open it. Now we close this switch and we have our voltage on the output. So what we have is a delay, and if we have this happen fast enough, it won't have an audio artifact that we could hear. And so whatever time it takes to transfer the charge to each stage would add a little bit of delay each time. And so we now have a digitally controlled analog delay, which was called a bucket brigade because it was like an old fashioned firefighting bucket brigade where you would hand buckets of water from one person to the next to be able to toss on the fire. Now this is a little oversimplified. If I want to draw this a little more like the actual circuit, I will redo this. We had a substrate because this of course was a integrated circuit and we would have capacitors above that substrate, each one with a control line to it. So we could put some charge in between this capacitor and the substrate. And then we could, by changing the voltage at each of these control wires here on the gates of these integrated circuit capacitors, we could actually transfer 100% of the charge from one to the other and wouldn't have the problem that I didn't mention with the other one, but of course, each time we transferred that charge from one capacitor to the other, we would lose half of the voltage. And so that would be a problem if that's the way it actually worked. But they actually work more like this. And here's an animation from Wikipedia that shows the whole idea in operation, transferring charge from one capacitor to the other. And so that was the bucket brigade device. And it wasn't long before someone thought, hey, you know, we can make these chips light sensitive. After all, transistors and diodes are light sensitive. We can take advantage of this and use it photographically. Now, the simplest way to do this would be to have one row of pixels. So I'll just draw them real quickly. And of course, each one of these is basically our bucket brigade device, but designed to collect light and turn that light into charge. If photons would come in, knock electrons out of the matrix, and they would be floating around, so that would be excess charge. And 
each time a photon does that we get another electron so if a lot of photons hit here we get a lot of electrons if a few photons hit here we get fewer electrons so we can get a, a one row or one line of image here and that could be used in various ways either uh, scan an image across that like uh, these I believe are actually still used in fax machines so we could like drag a piece of paper across there and image it one line at a time but that was the basic idea and of course once we do that how do we get the image out of there well we had these capacitors in here pretty much the same arrangement we have here and we could shift that out serially to get the information out of it but of course for photography we needed something a little more sophisticated than one row at a time otherwise we would have had to have a mechanical scanner of some sort so they developed that into a chip that had many rows of those light sensitive cells and now we had control circuitry around this to where we could work with one column at a time and so we could expose this to light and then shift the information out I don't know why they do it vertically but apparently they do this vertically horizontally would work just as well but maybe because of the aspect ratio because we usually take pictures that are wider than tall and so we'd have less work to get each column out than if we had to do each row but anyway these are shifted out one at a time and so we can get the information from that row get the information from that row get the information from that row etc etc and we can pull that information out into a shift register and eventually take that out one row at a time in serial format we haven't gotten into digital electronics yet but we will talk then about shift registers and serial and parallel communications and such but basically we can pull this out one bit at a time and grab that information one bit at a time and reassemble it in a computer memory and have an image and of course we just need to redesign this so that we have multiple pixels with filters in front of them so that they're sensitive to different wavelengths of light and then we can do red blue and green and get an image that is in full color so that's the basic idea of a charged coupled device is a photographic sensor which is a matrix of photosensitive cells that are coupled together such that we can serially take the information out of there there's been a lot of refinements and a lot of variations on this theme for one thing you'll probably notice that in early digital cameras you took a picture you sometimes got what was called bloom and here's an example of it where there's something bright in the picture and it would spoil the whole column of pixels because the electrons would leak out of that particular pixel that got overexposed into the adjacent vertical ones because of the nature of the way this was made it was fairly easy for charge to leak from one to the other and so we had to find ways to mitigate that one was with a diode called a pinned diode which was a diode with one end of it very thin physically so that the charge could be completely removed from that and we could remove the charge from that in such a way as to keep it from affecting adjacent pixels another way was to modify the device so that it wasn't sensitive to light all the time somehow getting the information out of the sensitive part so for example some CCDs all of the cells are activated at once you take a picture so it's sort of like a film camera you open the shutter electronically take the picture and close the shutter then transfer the charge to another layer of transistors to hold that charge and not change and then you could shift that out and the actual charge coupled device would be behind the photosensitive layer and between them if I understand right would be those pinned diodes that would move the charge from the photosensitive layer to the other layer that could be shifted out I might not be 100% correct about that but I from what I've been able to read that might be the way it worked but uh, the idea is that some charge coupled devices are gathering light all the time and then we shift that information out and as we shift it out we're still uh, sensitive to light which can cause some smearing and uh, one thing that it does cause for sure uh, since we are still taking the picture as we shift the information out we get some artifacts such as here's a propeller of an airplane that was taken with a CCD camera and you can see that the propeller image is rather weird because that propeller was moving at the same time the image was being shifted out and that's very typical of digital cameras you'll get these kinds of artifacts so some CCDs were made so that you activate the entire matrix expose it then turn it off 
transfer the charge out and then shift it out so that we take one picture. I think those are probably the more high-end CCDs, but typically they are taking a picture all the time and we shift that out quickly. And so we can get some smear effects and uh, those don't seem to be too big of a problem, but one big problem is a moving object is going to have some artifacts in there. So that's a well-known aspect of digital cameras due to the way that the photograph is taken. So that's the basic idea of a CCD. Now I said that they've been largely superseded by CMOS sensors. That would be in high-end equipment and inexpensive uh, equipment. Uh, such as webcams and such, I think you're going to find a lot of CCDs still and not CMOS sensors. The main difference is that a CMOS sensor works a lot like a CCD, except each pixel has a transistor connected to it to act as an amplifier, which makes it more sensitive and also resolves some of the problems such as shutter lag because we can shift the information out parallel rather than serial, so get the information out faster with a CMOS sensor than we can with a CCD, if I understand them correctly. So you might see that some cameras are advertised to be made with CMOS sensors rather than CCDs, and that means, of course, they're going to be more sensitive, less prone to shutter lag or other problems such as that smearing, uh, which is part of what shutter lag causes that we talked about with CMOS sensors. So that's the basic idea of sensor arrays such as this. They can be made either like one row, very large that have millions of sensors on them. Or, for example, a typical modern optical mouse may have a sensor with a 4x4 matrix, only 16 cells, and it uses that to figure out how the mouse is being moved. So there's a lot of applications for these photographic sensors other than just taking pictures. So that's the basic idea of photographic sensors, CCDs, and CMOS sensors. And if you found this useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel and helps people find this material. And to take my free course in electronics technology, you can go to vocademy.net. To help me keep Vocademy free and make these videos, you can go to patreon.com slash vocademy and pledge your support or to make a one-time donation, you can go to paypal.me slash Voked, V-O-C-E-D. If you can't donate, you can help me by subscribing to this channel and hitting the gray bell when you do so that you get notified when I put up new videos. A big thank you to my patrons at Patreon and my one-time donors. I could not do this without your support, and thanks to everyone for watching.